We begin this broadcast with Ukrainian President Zelensky's historic visit to Washington, D.C. This is the first time he has left Ukraine since Russian forces invaded 300 days ago. After flying to Washington in a U.S. military jet, Zelensky spent several hours with President Biden, and then he spoke directly to the American people. I wish you peace. I think that is the main thing, and you understand it only when the war in your country, when somebody like these terrorists from Russia come to your houses. And I wish you to see your children alive and adults. And I wish you to see your children when they will go to universities and to see their children. I, th I think that is the main thing what I can wish you. And of course, to be t together with us, John Lee, because we really fight for our common victory against this tyranny. That is real life. And we will win. And I really want win together. The Biden administration today announced nearly $2 billion in new military aid, including Patriot missiles. This evening, dressed in military clothing, Zelensky spoke before a joint meeting of Congress, walking into the House chamber to a lengthy standing ovation. Then he thanked the United States for supporting Ukraine. Ukraine holds its lines and will never surrender. Thank you for both financial packages you have already provided us with and the ones you may be willing to decide on. Your money is not charity. It's an investment in the global security and democracy that we handle in the most responsible way. Very powerful words. Also on this very busy news night, we are awaiting the final report from the January 6th committee. It is now expected to be released at some point tomorrow. Tonight, the panel did release transcripts of 34 different witnesses who pleaded the fifth during all or at least part of their testimony. Michael Flynn, for example, his transcript shows he took the fifth on just about every single question during his interview. We're also waiting for the full release of Donald Trump's taxes from the House Ways and Means Committee. Yesterday, the committee said the IRS failed to audit his taxes during his first two years in office, even though that is the agency policy. Oregon Democrat Senator Ron Wyden accuses the IRS of being asleep at the wheel. But tonight, the New York Times reports that Presidents Obama and Biden were audited regularly. So far, the IRS is refusing to comment on any of this. There's also news tonight about former FTX CEO Sam Bankman-Fried, who is now in FBI custody here in the United States. After extradition from the Bahamas, he is about to face federal charges here in the U.S. When the January 6th committee releases its final report tomorrow, there will still be unanswered questions. Many of those questions concern security failures surrounding the attack. According to documents reviewed by NBC News, the FBI had been warned by an informant that Trump's December 2020 tweet promoting a, quote, wild protest at the Capitol was considered by the far right as a call to arms. Almost three weeks later, of course, thousands of rioters descended on the Capitol. So let's discuss. We welcome back retired Lieutenant General Russell Honore, a decorated Army veteran. He led the security review of the Capitol after the January 6th attack. General, I'm so glad you're here. What do you make of this report that the FBI was warned that January 6th could be violent? Yeah, that's quite concerning, isn't it? That's the job of the FBI. That's the job of Homeland Security. That's the job of the Joint Terrorism Task Force right there in Washington, D.C., it's the job of the Secret Service. The government didn't work that day. Uh, when it comes to reading the room, reading the uh, web and information that was coming forward, and when the security information came from Norfolk on the 5th, it went to the JTF headquarters in Washington, D.C. We traced that. It was given to an officer in the Capitol Police, and somehow that information didn't get down to the line officers that there could be a threat to the Capitol with uh, people armed, ready to come and enter the Capitol. That information never got to the line officers. 
through a misinterpretation of what the how they could use the secret information. And in our review, we made recommendations on how they could better handle intel, how they could, uh, right now, all the Capitol Police have phones as a part of our recommendation because they couldn't communicate that day. Uh, while they stood strong and prevented uh, the insurrection from uh, destroying our democracy, there were a lot of issues with security uh, that we all see laid out. And we highlighted that and as a result of our recommendation to put fencing, uh, retractable fencing, add more bomb sniffing dogs, a horse platoon for crowd control, uh, as well as improving cameras at the Capitol. Uh, the House put a $2.9 billion supplemental in, but that was turned back in the Senate by Senator Leahy, and it went in as a 1.9. So much of the recommendations we did for physical security to include 800 officers, 400 of them to go protect dignitary support for congressmen in route and at their home, and another 400 at the Capitol, which we thought they need, uh, Stephanie. Then do you believe that when we all see this final January 6th report, that could motivate Congress to do more, take more action to make us more safe and secure? I hope so. Uh, because there's still gaps. The Capitol is secure. The, the Capitol Police uh, bounced back. They're doing their resilient. They did a good job. They're still woefully short 400 officers, as was uh, seen by the Capitol, new Capitol Police chief who said he need 400 more officers. It's going to take time to produce that because of uh, training issues and getting them certified. But they need 400 more officers at the Capitol. The Capitol is secure for normal protests. It's not secure to deal with domestic terrorists and show up in a group of 10,000. But we need a better reading of the intelligence so we can call in two National Guard MP battalions if we need them and have them there on time. We can do better and be prepared had we read the room, had the FBI and the Secret Service had been directly communicating with the Capitol Police Board it's quite likely we could have prevented the Capitol from being even being penetrated that day, Ms. Stephanie. Read the room rather than read the intention of the former president. Your expertise is in safety, security, and humanity. Another huge story this week is the surge of migrants that are making their yeah. way to the border. What needs to get done? We need to speak in plain language that people understand. Uh, coming to the border uh, to try and seek asylum, this is the wrong time of year to do this. People with their children, and we know they've walked hundreds of miles, sacrificed to try to get to a country to, for a better life. But we have to get better at telling them coming in the winter time is not the right time to try to migrate to the United States. And the, the U.S. have to figure out what are the rules. I mean, we've had over the last two and a half, three years, uh, mixed messaging. You could come, you can't come. If you come, we're going to send you back. Then we're not going to send you back. We're going to let you in. Uh, even I'm confused, and I speak the language here. We need to clean up the messaging and send the people. Uh, if you come, we're going to send you back if you don't follow the rules of immigration. And if you get here, we're going to take care of you. But this... Thousands of people showing up in this Arctic blast that's coming is dangerous. And it makes uh, the country look like we're not treating people in a humane way when we see children and families laying on the side of a ditch. We go all over the world to save people's lives. And by and large, you know, we're doing the best we can. But the NGOs on the border overrun, and we haven't put the resources there if we're going to process these people. We've got the resource to do this better. We can handle 10 to 15,000 people a day if we had to and put them on airplanes and send them back to get information for them and said, hey, come back and apply later or whatever that decision is. But we need to know what the hell the decision is, because right now most people are confused and it's causing people pain and suffering out in the cold. And it's having a hell of a morale impact on our Border Patrol people and the ones who have to deal with this. We can do this better. We, we put people on the moon. We can do this. This is not... It's hard, but we can do this. We got the logistics to do this better.
Well, sir, you always speak to us in a way that we can understand and we appreciate it. Always good to see you. Lieutenant General Russell Honore, Merry Christmas to you. The last thing before we go tonight, holiday travel chaos. A powerful winter storm system is now moving across the eastern two-thirds of the country, producing dangerous blizzard conditions with fierce winds, heavy snow, and sudden Arctic cold, sadly just in time for Christmas. Blame it all on what is being called a bomb cyclone parked over the eastern Great Lakes. This is what the wrapping winds around it are going to look like on Friday, pushing wind chills in some places to 40 below or even lower. And for the airlines that are hoping to get travelers home for the holidays, the timing could not be worse, as NBC's Tom Costello reports tonight. Wednesday night and with snow already hitting a crowded Minneapolis airport, Chicago O'Hare is also running at full throttle. We're going to steal them for a uh, San Diego outbound, send them to Bravo 5. Please. Counting down with the storm expected to slow air traffic across the region to a trickle within 24 to 36 hours. The Kappelman family among the thousands who decided to leave early for Florida. We looked at our schedules and it made sense just to try to beat it and hopefully not have cancellations and deal with issues come Friday. Airlines are waiving change fees and encouraging passengers to rebook if they can. This is by 1865 United Airlines service to Miami. Omar Idris runs United's O'Hare operations. This is exactly the kind of glitch you don't need this week, right? The timing of the storm is challenging for sure, but we're ready, we're prepared, we've got good procedures, good policies. Nationwide, passenger volume is approaching 2019 levels. We're expecting winds 30 to 50 miles an hour in Chicago and Midway starting tomorrow. To keep the system moving, the FAA Command Center in Virginia has opened military airspace to commercial flights. And here's your boarding passes. Alaska Airlines, the country's fifth biggest, focuses on the West Coast and is also navigating volatile weather. CEO Ben Minicucci. You know, we operate in the 30 to 40 degree range. You don't know if it's going to be rain. You don't know if it's going to be snow. So you always have to be ready. You're right on the edge. Right on the edge. Yeah. Well, you know, it's not going to be good, even in some places accustomed to snow. This monster storm is forecast to be the worst we have seen in decades. So please do not fool around. Stock up on supplies, especially batteries and non-perishable foods. If you really do need to go out in this storm, though, please stay safe. We really do want you around in the new year.